Hi. Thank you all for coming. My name is Sue Minkoff. I founded LifeWorks Wellness Center with Dr. Minkoff. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about him because I know many of you know him, but I don't know if you all know his story. So he went to University of Wisconsin Medical School. He graduated magna cum laude. And then he did his internship and residency at University of California, San Diego. And he got a fellowship in infectious disease, pediatric infectious disease. He was a pediatrician for 15 years. And he worked emergency room for 25 years. Um, I drug him one day to a seminar by a very famous um, nutritional biochemist. And he got bit by the bug. And he didn't stop learning. And as you know, delve very deeply into the type of medicine he practices and, as you know, practices excellent medicine with both combined. Um, he is a triathlete, an Ironman triathlete, and has competed in 42 Ironman triathlons, and he's going to compete in his 43rd um, in about three weeks. So I'm sure you'll find tonight's lecture very enlightening, and so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Minkoff. On your seats, you have some information. Um, do we have a survey from the Nature's Food Path? <coughs> not, not, no, not <coughs> so you have um, information about LifeWorks Wellness Center if you don't know about it. But also, if you could please fill this out if you are not already a patient and you're interested in becoming a patient. Thank you. Hi, good evening. So I did this talk in front of a national group uh, on Lyme disease uh, a year ago and I thought that there was a lot of interesting things here and, and rather than just talk about just sort of a Lyme off the top of my head, I can show you some pictures. I, can, I think I can make it more real for you. So some of these I'm just going to skip over. Some of them are, um, are very interesting. Uh, one of the things that occurs in medicine is that there is, <clears throat> it's, Medicine is not a science. Uh, we say we practice medicine, and we say that because um, a lot of, if you look at the history of medicine, a lot of what's been done five years later isn't being done anymore, or 20 years later isn't being done anymore, because it just wasn't true. When I started medical school, the original professor who introduced us uh, was a long gray beard. He was a professor of medicine, and he said, listen, uh, medical knowledge is doubling about, this was 1974, medical knowledge is doubling about every five years. He said, so as you go through medical school, there will be, you know, many, many more times the information available than it was when you first started. And he said, what we know for sure is that about half of what we're teaching you is true. He said, that's the good side. He said, uh, uh, but we're not sure which half. So, and that remains to be true. If you look at the history of medicine, as I said, it's mostly myth and very little reality as to what is really workable. Medicine is not practiced on an outcome basis. It's practiced on a group basis of people deciding this is what should be done, this is what must be done, but we're never going to look back and say that what we did before wasn't right, we're just going to keep going. And so if you look at what's being done in medicine today, in areas outside of acute care, gynecology, orthopedics, medicine that has to do with chronic illness. 50% of the people in this country now have chronic illness worldwide, okay? They have some neurological disease, they have some autoimmune disease, they have chronic diabetes, they have chronic Lyme, they have chronic fatigue, and the population in general is going down, and the medical science to debug it is going down right with it because the solutions that are being used simply do not work. They usually make people more sick. They cover up what's actually wrong, and it's a big problem. They used to say that the number one cause of death right now was heart disease. About 700,000 people a year die of heart disease. Second is cancer. A little under 700,000 people a year die of cancer. The real number one cause of disease is medical doctors. Okay, it's over 700,000 people a year die as a result of the medical treatment that they get. This isn't my numbers, this comes out of Harvard, it's been published, it's real, it, your doctors are dangerous, okay? And I think that, that anytime you walk into, now, on the, on the good side, um, if you have an acute appendix, if you need a C-section, if you get in a car accident, if you're in the middle of a heart attack, 
We have the best medicine in the world, okay? Like it's really good. But if you have a chronic problem where you're being given a medicine to block the symptom that you have, and that symptom isn't any better in two or four weeks, then you're barking up the wrong tree and your doctor probably has no idea of what's really wrong with you. He is trying to help you. This is not an evil purpose on the point of the doctor. But it's a, I just don't know, and I'm really not very interested to look. And that's the problem. So this myth versus reality is a big thing. What is really true? Um, <coughs> medical myths, LDL cholesterol is bad. We know LDL cholesterol, if it's high, you'll live longer. OK? Uh, cancer treatments work. Rarely do they work. Don't eat egg yolks. You should. They're good for you. Um, diabetic drugs prevent heart artery disease. No, they double the rate of artery disease. Uh, breast implants are safe. No, they're not. You put a plastic bottle in a 100 degree kind of 98.6 degree car and let it sit there for a little while, a couple of days, let alone 20 years, how much of the plastics from that implant are going to be in that water? And how, many, how much of that plastic is going to be in your body? There's about 40 ingredients in an average breast implant and they're all chemicals and they're all bad and many of them are carcinogens and no one has any idea what the combination does, let alone each one, okay? Uh, trust your doctor, uh, verify. Uh, electroconvulsive therapy works, no it doesn't. It causes brain damage, okay? This is for your, your psychotic, it's, it's terrible. Uh, we got it all, you had an operation, you have a tumor, we got it all, yeah. A lot of times we didn't. Okay, so if you look at medicine from the idea of first do no harm, the Hippocratic Oath, okay? Do no harm, whatever, you know, as an intention, it's good. Disease begins in the colon, that's true. It goes back to Hippocrates, okay? If you're not having a good bowel movement every day, you will end up sick. The doctor of the future will cure disease with the care of the human frame and attention to nutrition. That was Edison, Thomas Edison couple hundred years ago, okay? Now here's what happens. This is, you all know this movie, okay? So I didn't say it would be easy, I just said it would be the truth. You can't handle the truth, it's true. <laughs> and then there's a definition in the next quote, which is in your. Now some of you may know this definition, but in your means that you, you suffer long enough of, with something that it stops bothering you. You like get accustomed to it, even though it's not good, but you now decide to put up with it. So today's children inures children to violence, okay? If you show a fresh person who never saw TV most of what's on TV, they would be abhorred by it. But children watch TV now and they see people killing each other and doing all kinds of things or these video games and they're just inured to it, they're, you're used to it, it's just life, okay? Pharmaceutical companies inure the public to use of drugs. I've got a headache, I better take a Tylenol. I've got a sore knee, well I better take an Advil, okay? We're inured to it, we're programmed. So Morpheus says, you have to understand, most of these people are not ready to be unplugged. And many of them are so inured, so helplessly dependent on the system, that they will fight to protect it. And that's what's happening. You know, you look at this whole insurance debacle with Obamacare and the rest of it. We want our doctor. We're going to keep our doctor. Okay? Even though a lot of people are getting sick. So I think you have to unplug from this whole system because we are barraged with it constantly. TV and ads. Do this. Do that. This is good. You go on the internet. There is more of false information on the internet probably and there's true information and honestly in the medical arena it's very hard to even figure out what is true and what isn't true it's hard for me so I know it's hard for people who aren't that educated on it as, uh, as to what you know what do I do okay so we're gonna take a deep dive here a deep plunge and I want you to keep your ears wide open <laughs> and we're gonna talk about Lyme disease now it's everywhere. It's a worldwide epidemic. It's been covered up for a long time. Health departments decided that it wasn't in Florida until last year when the Infectious Disease Society of Florida said, oh well, there is Lyme in Florida. 
okay? There are hundreds of thousands, probably millions of cases. Most of the lab tests that test for Lyme don't work. They don't detect it when you have it, okay? LabCorp, Quest, these labs do not have accurate testing for Lyme. And if you've been tested for Lyme and you might have Lyme and those tests are negative, they, it's like the test wasn't even done. There are a few labs in the United States which are actually good. They will detect Lyme when it's there most of the time, and it's, it's worth doing those tests. I had somebody yesterday, she's the wife of a very prominent person in this city, and, um, and she was, she's had chronic symptoms for years. She has been to Cleveland Clinic, and to Mayo Clinic, and to University of Miami, and to University of South Florida with chronic symptoms to the point where she felt like she was actually pretty crazy because they kept telling her there's nothing wrong to, with you, you don't have this, you don't have that, you don't have this, and she has Lyme disease. She's also got h real high levels of, of, of mold toxins in her body, okay? And those can make anybody feel and act crazy. Without a diagnosis, it's even worse. At least if you have a real diagnosis, you can do some things that will sort of unwind the person and help them out, okay? 99% of people who have Lyme had no acute symptoms of infection when they got it. Very, very few people that I see, and we see lots of people with Lyme, and many of them don't even live here. They come from all over the place. They don't have a recall of, yes, I got a tick bite, and yes, I got a bullseye rash, and yes, I got a flu symptom, and yes, I went to the doctor to get it checked out. It's very, very rare. So most people don't have any acute symptoms. And, um, and most people had Lyme, have Lyme, but it took some trigger to turn it on. Something else was going on or happened, okay? It might have been a stress trigger, it might have been an operation, it might have been a car accident, it might have been uh, some other kind of infection, it might be a prolonged course of antibiotics, but then the thing turned on. Then the Lyme turned out. If you get acute Lyme disease, antibiotics work pretty well. My, my grandson lives in New York City, they ha or outside of New York City. They have deer in their yard, the, so there's ticks all over the place, and they play outside, and he, was, he got bit by a tick. They, didn't, they, they got bit by a tick. Uh, they didn't notice the tick. Um, and then a few days later, he's, uh, he's limping around, so his parents call me and they said, he's limping, what's wrong with him? I'm here, they're in New York. So I said, well, why don't you take him to an orthopedist? He's six years old and he likes to jump off of high places and maybe he injured his hip joint. So they took him to the orthopedist, he did the x-ray, he said, no, his hip joint is fine, but it looks like there's some reaction within his joint. He's got some kind of acute arthritis. They did the Lyme test on him, the Lyme test was positive on him. He got three weeks of amoxicillin and he was fine. Okay, so that can work. Uh, the treatment of long-term uh, Lyme with oral and IV antibiotics is very, very rarely successful. It just doesn't work. Almost all of the infectious disease doctors, now I was an infectious disease doctor, I am not anti-medicine, I am not antibiotic, but I am for things that work. And I was just seeing a patient today. This patient had seen an infectious disease doctor in DC, he is a Lyme doctor. And they were on antibiotics for five years, four antibiotics for five years. And I said, did you see any, she's down here now, did you see anyone who went to that clinic that ever got over their disease and went home and was fine? And basically, it's not all, but very, very few. They just don't work. And I'll show you why in a few minutes. Lyme really is a very low order organism, which means it's not a big bad wolf. That's why when you get it, usually you don't have any kind of symptom with it, okay? It gets you, you don't even know it. The tick falls off and you never knew it. These ticks are very small and, um, and you might miss it, okay? I find that almost all people who have been diagnosed with an autoimmune disease like MS or rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or Sjogren's, almost all of them have Lyme. Now the rheumatoid doctors don't look very hard for infections and all of their medicines are either some kind of anti-inflammatory 
or some kind of steroid, or some kind of embryl, humera, some kind of cytokine blocker. It's not finding out what is the agent that is doing this. It is blocking your immune system from working, and that sets you up for all kinds of other types of diseases. Because with a non-immune system, and you could listen on the TV set when you hear the ads for these things, TB, cancer, weird kinds of infections, because your immune system is basically turned off. Okay. Now, originally, Lyme disease was, was, was in, uh, I think it was the late 60s or early 70s, it was first discovered in Lyme, Connecticut. That's where the name, there's a town in Connecticut called Lyme. And it was an infectious agent. They had an epidemic of women who had arthritis and flu symptoms, and it turned out that they found this organism in the joint fluid. And this organism is called Borrelia burgdorferi. The microbiologist who discovered it, was, his name was Willie Burgdorferi, that was his name, and so they named it after him of uh, Borrelia as a certain type of bacteria. Um, what I have found that unless you handle the other things going on, you're, the Lyme doesn't get better. There's nutritional deficiencies, electropollution, toxin load, gut problems, immune dysfunction, co-infections, hormone imbalance. These are the really important things. And if you can get those under control, then treatments for Lyme disease are usually quite successful. About 85% of our patients actually get better. Now, what Lyme isn't? So, in, uh, there are some infections that are just like overwhelming nasty, and you probably, you've heard about them. So, uh, this is like a flesh-eating strep, okay? This is a very, very rapidly aggressive uh, uh, infection that this person got and it can eat up your leg in a few days, okay? That's not, Lyme isn't that. Meningococcemia is a bacteria that is very, what we call virulent, it's very strong. You get men uh, a meningococcal infection and you can get meningitis and you can die within days or go into a coma or if you're septic, your, 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 your blood vessels start to leak and you bleed and it's very bad, okay? That's a bad, that's, the Lyme's not that, okay? Here's another one, just an example. Bubonic plague, okay? You get bit by the flea that bit the rat that had bubonic plague and you get a big swelling where a lymph node is and you might have 48 to 72 hours and um, What's that? Huh? Okay, and it can be very fatal. I saw a couple cases of plague when I was doing infectious disease in California. They knew that the that the rodents in the in the outer country had um, had, uh, <laughs> had that there was plague there, and the Center for Disease Control uh, let us know that there was some plague out there, and you might see some patients. And so this five-year-old came in. He, was, he looked feverish, he looked terrible. He had a big bubo. A bubo is a lymph node, is a swollen lymph node. So this flea bit him on the foot. The lymph node got swollen. He came to the office, he looked terrible. I remembered, oh my God, maybe he's got plague. We gave him a shot of penicillin. We put him in my car. We drove him to the hospital, which is three blocks. And by the time he got to the hospital, he was dead. Okay, Lyme's not that. These are like major, major serious things. Lyme's not that, okay? Now. What's so interesting about this organism is that it, we see this organism on the microscope and the body isn't even looking at it. It isn't even attacking it. They swim around as if nobody even cares, like the immune system doesn't even care. It is able to penetrate various tissue barriers. It can get through the blood-brain barrier, it can get into the brain, it can get into red cells and white blood cells and, 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 and connective tissue very easily without producing an inflammatory response, okay? We don't see elevated blood counts, we don't see abscesses. It's very low grade as an organism. Now, if you think of it, when, when I was doing infectious disease, you'd sometimes get two guys in a fight and one guy would bite the other guy. And it's, so it's a puncture deep wound, there's a lot of bacteria in the mouth, six million bacteria in the human mouth, or six billion, and the and the and it was a dilemma about antibiotics because what did he get and what would you treat it with? Because sometimes these these infections were very serious. 
The question is, how many bacteria are in a tick's mouth or in a mosquito's mouth? No, I don't think anyone has any idea. This is past, we know now, by any kind of arthropod. Arthropod are biting insects. So it could be bed bugs or fleas uh, or ticks or, um, or mosquitoes, okay? And when they bite you, it isn't that they're one thing, the Borrelia bacteria, it isn't that one thing actually went in. A lot of things went in, okay? So it's, it's a bit more complex than it's this organism causes this disease. There really is usually four, five, six, seven that we can identify, and there's probably a whole bunch nobody's even thought of looking for that are part of this infection combination. Okay? These are the sort of, usually, if you look at the list of what masks or presents as Lyme disease, and Lyme disease is a, is a great masquerader. It can look like a lot of things. Okay? So Borrelia is the original organism. Bartonella is the cat scratch bug. Now, if you get scratched by a cat or bit by a cat and you get acute Borrelia, acute cat scratch fever, the disease is called. And when I was a pediatrician, I saw, we saw lots of kids that had cat scratch fever and they're sick, okay? You see where the bite was, you see the, the lymph channel, you see the big lymph node, they have a fever and they're sick and you give them augmentin and in three or four days their fever comes down, the lymph node comes down, this heals up and they're fine. Okay, this Bartonella is not that Bartonella. We just don't see that kind of reaction. Okay, and then these are some other organisms that are part of it. I won't belabor you with these. Um, now, often we see co-infections, other kinds of co-infections. You had Epstein-Barr when you were little, it turns back on. You had CMV or one of the herpes viruses or chickenpox or HPV or Candida. So there's a whole group of things where these organisms at a prior time you had an infection with, they are still around your body in a dormant state and they turn back on. So now you've got a bigger mess. And sometimes they turn on and then the Lyme turns on after, it could be either way. Mold is a huge problem today, it's a huge problem. Um, 60 percent of the public buildings in the United States are thought to be moldy. In Florida, of course, it's a moldy environment, so there's mold everywhere. Um, now buildings are sealed up so you don't get good airflow, and there's synthetic fabrics which the mold can grow on, and so mold produces toxins, biotoxins, and those biotoxins aerosolize. They come into the environment. We know that when mold is around Wi-Fi and electronic frequencies, it becomes stressed. And when the mold is stressed, it puts out more biotoxins. There was a study that looked at this, you may have heard it, where two piles of aspergillus mold were put on a table in a room with Wi-Fi. And around one of the colonies, they put a Faraday cage, which protected the mold from the electronic frequencies. The other one was exposed. They let the mold grow for a month, and then they harvested the biotoxins from each pile. The one that had the Faraday cage versus the one that was exposed to the Wi-Fi, the Wi-Fi one had 600 times the production of biotoxin than the one that was protected. There's virtually Wi-Fi everywhere. You can't hardly go anywhere. And these molds in these closed up buildings where there is electronic, more and more electronic frequencies and who knows what this 5G thing is going to do, it's going to be worse. And I think that's why these, these molds are blooming. Uh, so it's a problem. And I check every person for mold and I know for sure that if you're one of the 22% of people that is mold susceptible, mold susceptible means when you're exposed to it, your genes turn on and an inflammation response which will not turn off unless you are out of a mold environment. And if you have that going on, your Lyme will never get better. I've done this with actually quite a few people, like I'm detecting mold in you, you get the guy, the mold expert out to your house, you get your house checked, you get your office checked, you get your car checked, wherever you spend a lot of time. And you've got to make sure that it's mold free, because if it's not mold free, your Lyme will never settle down. So it's a really important thing. These are just a couple of tests with mold. So back in the back in the in the in the late 1800s, there was an argument going on in France. 
the two, there was two prominent microbiologists. One was Pasteur and the other guy's name was Bashan. Pasteur was the chairman of microbiology at the University of Paris and he was the big mucky muck in town. And he said that disease is caused by the bug. You get the bug, you're gonna get the disease. Bashant was like a low-level microbiologist. He was trying to make his name, and they would have public arguments, and Pasteur would always win because he was the big university professor. Bashant said, no, it's the host, it's the person. He said, in an epidemic, not everybody dies from plague, not everybody gets strep throat, it's the organism. It's the health of the organism. And so they had this big debate. It turned out that on, on, on Pasteur's deathbed, he said, I have one more thing to say before I take my last breath. It's send a messenger to Bashant and tell him he was right. Okay? <laughs> now, um, in Lyme, it's the host. Okay? See, in plague, it's the bug. In meningococcus, it's the bug. In flesh-eating strep, it's the bug. In Lyme, it's the host. If you have a susceptible host who's got viruses and, you know, and, uh, and mold toxins and bacteria and, and they're, you know, they're, they're stressed out, you got to fix the host. All right, now this is a picture of Lyme. Some of you that, uh, when we've looked at your blood, we've seen these things and they swim around. Um, appearing like nobody could even care less about them. So this is Borrelia burgdorferi. It's called a spirochete, um, uh, and it looks like it looks like that. Now, when the disease actually occurs, so you get a rash. It's a very typical rash. It's called erythema chronica migraines. It looks like a bullseye. Then it goes to the other organs. Then it goes quiet and it can go everywhere, and it can appear later with arthritis, with emotional stuff, with neurological symptoms. Sometimes the emotional stuff is the presenting thing. The person is very anxious, they're very depressed, they can't sleep, they feel crazy, and their brain is infected with Lyme or as a result of Lyme toxins. And I've seen some wild stuff occur with people. I had a guy, I think I have the picture in here, let me just wait and see. So there's the bullseye. Okay, sometimes it actually, you get that, you get, like that's a perfect one, okay? Sometimes like that. Now, it, this, this bacteria is very interesting. It's very interesting because it is very sophisticated. On the bottom there, it says organisms were found in Egyptian mummies. This is an old, old bug. Egyptian mummies are like 1,000 BC, so this organism has been around for at least 3,000 years. And it has survived because it has a lot of ways that it can get around us detecting it. Now, there's 300, over 300 known strains. If your antibody is against a couple of the strains, but it's not against another strain, you're going to turn up negative. Okay, so you don't get the diagnosis. 100 strains have been discovered in the United States. Um, and uh, here's how it works. Now, if you put some bunch of bacteria like in a colon, and the person takes antibiotics, and it kills a whole bunch of the bacteria, some of the ones that are there have already built in defenses against that antibiotic. They either prevent the antibiotic from getting inside or they have a way to neutralize it once it gets inside. But they have a mechanism to stop it so then the antibiotic doesn't work. And what those things are, they're called plasmids. They're little pieces of genetic information and bacteria can share them with each other. The average bacteria has about three plasmids. Borrelia has 21. No one's ever had an organism that had more plasmids than, than Borrelia. So it has a big repertoire of, I can exist in this space and you can throw at me pretty much what you want, but you won't get me or you won't detect me. Here's some examples. We measure on most people with Lyme this, this thing called a CD57. CD57 is a lymphocyte. It is an immune cell. And this immune cell's job is to kill basically two organisms. One is TB and the other one is Lyme. 
Now, what we find is that Borrelia has a toxin that kills that particular lymphocyte. So if we, we, someone comes in, and I suspect Lyme, and I order CD57, and good is about 180, and above 60 is acceptable, and I had a new one today, it was 14. That person has Lyme, and they've had Lyme for probably a long time, and their immune system is suppressed by the Lyme. Their lymph cells, the ones that are supposed to kill the Lyme bacteria, those, they, it's killed a whole bunch of them. So now it doesn't fight as well. It can't go after them as well, because there just aren't enough of them. Okay? These Lyme can hide inside of cells and inside of tissues. This Lyme has another thing that if the, if the immune cell is coming at it, it has a thing that it can push out. It's called nagalase. Cancers do this too. Where it doesn't allow the immune cell to actually get activated so it can eat the Lyme bug. So it gets hard to fight it. There's a couple of other things that they can do is they can actually coat themselves with tissue that looks like you. So when your immune system looks at it, it's, it's decoyed so that it's not even seen. And then what happens when you run an immune test against that with an antibody, you may not get it. This is the problem with diagnosis. Okay, now Lyme can exist in multiple forms. It, it can exist in that original form that I saw, which is that spiral looking thing, but sometimes it can exist as what looks like a cyst, or it can look like a bacteria. It can change its shape as a defense mechanism or as a survival mechanism. So that makes it hard to get. It can change its outer surface proteins, pre preventing immune recognition. It can surround itself with the host's own lymphocyte cell membrane so that the immune system doesn't even see it. Now, these things can, can produce biofilms. Now, biofilm, if you, if you don't brush your teeth for a day and you take your fingernail and scrape the back of your front tooth, you'll get kind of a waxy, you all have that experience? Kind of a waxy kind of stuff. Now, that's biofilm. If you smear that on a microscope, what you would see is there's a whole group of different kinds of bacteria that have coated themselves with sort of a, it's a kind of a mucus protein. And they do that to protect themselves. So these biofilms exist in the blood of patients with complex infections like Lyme. Oops, I'll show you what they look like. So this is a, this is a microscope blow up of blood. These are red blood cells. Those big white smudges are white blood cells. And you see that thing? That's a biofilm. That's got hundreds or thousands of different bacteria, funguses, sometimes parasites. They form a little collective community and they surround themselves. The immune system can't get at them and the antibiotics can't penetrate into them. So then the medicine from the outside doesn't work. Luckily, if you put that, if you expose that thing to ozone, it will dissolve it. And as the slide before this said, they're anaerobes. They don't like oxygen. Oxygen is toxic to them. When you expose them to ozone, it will dissolve the biofilms and it will kill the bacteria. Now, this is a laboratory that we use. It's called Fry Laboratories. And what he did was, when we send a blood specimen to them, they can, they, can, they can look at the biofilm and show that there are bacteria in that biofilm because the bacteria will light up with a fluorescent stain. And so normal on this is black. All this brightness is bacteria that have been stained by the stain, which proves that there is Lyme and Lyme family organisms, co-infections, in the blood. Now, when he then looks inside that biofilm to see what's in there, there are hundreds of organisms. And this is just a list of some of the organisms that they found in a biofilm on a particular research patient. So these are all kinds of things. There's, there's bacteria, there's funguses, there's amoebas. It's a whole collection of stuff. All right, there's a bunch of other organisms, and I'm just gonna go through this. Babesia is actually a parasite. It's an amoeba-type parasite. And it can get inside of 
These are red blood cells, and you, they can get inside the red blood cells, and they live there fine. Okay. Bartonella. This is a Bart. Oh, I didn't. Bartonella is the cat scratch one. Here's what he looks like. He's got these flagella. He, he's got little tails that wiggle so he can move around. Okay. Bartonella can produce a typical rash in someone. And what you see is you see these stria. These are all new. And within the stria, you get hemorrhage. And if you scrape those and look at it, you'll see the Bartonella. So sometimes people come in and say, I don't know what happened to me. You know, and they'll have this sometimes here, sometimes in their flank. Now this isn't teenage growth too fast or breasts growing too fast where you get the stria. This is an infection. These are infectious organisms that are in those stria. And they are hemorrhagic, they look like that, and they're usually tender. Ehrlichiosis is another one. They can get inside white blood cells or around the outside of white blood cells. These are all, all these things are parasitic. Now, this is a very interesting book. If you like medical detective work and medical, uh, uh, like medical truth, this is a very interesting book. Uh, this lady, Judy Mikovits, uh, was pretty much blackballed by the whole, in, the whole society of microbiology because she dared to think that there was another class of viruses which weren't really known, which were causing chronic fatigue. And these are called <coughs> retroviruses. And retroviruses are, are, are around, and we, saw, we find in some people that part of their complex with Lyme is that they have these retroviruses, we have a treatment for it, and we can take care of it. Now, if you look then back at, okay, what's, how do you sort of look at this in a way where you could have targets to go after to help someone get better? So we have to find what toxins and what infections are in that person's body because we have to be able to lower that load. We also have to find out what is that person missing? We do extensive testing on people where they're, okay, their zinc level's low and their fatty acid level's low and their amino acid level's low and they're not going to heal. They have to have these things within their body if they're going to ever get better. So you've got to add that back because the machine is actually broken. Sometimes structural things are really important. Scars can block healing. Dental infections are a huge thing because a dental infection undetected is putting toxins in your body and it's overwhelming your immune system and it's very hard to get better without handling it. There's also sometimes problems with the vertebrae and vertebrae that are out of place and they block the brain from being able to detoxify and being able to function right, and that's a big one too. So I am sort of constantly on the search. This, this brain one for me is only in the last couple of years that I even know about it, and I find that I've filled up a whole practice of someone because there's so many of these that I didn't even know about before. And I presented all that in, at, a, at a national medical meeting and hardly anyone there had ever even heard of it. But it's a huge thing, and it can make a difference in someone getting better and someone not. Okay, so there's some, there's some host factors too, like there is sometimes genetic things that have to be taken into consideration. The, the hottest one now is this methylation defect. I think it's overdone, but I think it could be true. It's easy to handle, and you can give a person a supplement. Uh, nutritional deficiencies we talked about, toxin load we have a bit talked about, but chemicals, heavy metals. We do a test on everybody where we're looking for environmental toxins, and a lot of times we find people are just overloaded. Sometimes it's styrofoams or plastics or chemicals or glyphosate or, or other um, organophosphate pesticides, and they have no idea, but they're toxins and they're part of the load of the host. Okay, Hormone deficiencies, gut issues, um, autoimmunity, uh, all these things are important. Let me just go back and show you this one. Unfortunately, this is a test that we can't do anymore. Um, the University of Kentucky used to have a test where if someone had a root canal and you wondered if it was a problem, you could send a specimen from the root of the tooth to the lab and they would do a, a test to see 
where there are bad toxins being produced by the bacteria in that tooth. And so this is a patient um, who doesn't mind me showing you his name, some of you might know him, <laughs> um, where he had, a, he had chronic fatigue and he had a root canal. And I did the test on him. And we sent it to the lab and the lab came back. Now, these enzymes are the enzymes of what's called the Krebs cycle. Well, the Krebs cycle is the main way that the cell makes energy. So the cell takes a, uh, a glucose molecule and oxygen, and one by one it pulls the carbon. The glucose molecule has six carbons, and one by one it pulls the carbons off the molecule. In the process of ripping off that carbon, there's energy released and it's captured. And these enzymes are part of the way that it gets captured. If you block these enzymes, this cell can't make energy because it needs these enzymes to block energy. What they found is that those root canal toxins, this is the percentage of inhibition, of stoppage of the enzyme working, average 93%. So you have root canal toxins leaking into central nervous system, into liver, into thyroid. Is that organ going to be able to produce enough energy so that it can do the work it's supposed to do? This is every individual cell. And the answer is no. You might have brain fog because 93% of a certain percentage of your brain cells have root canal toxin or clostridia toxin or plastic toxin or gasoline toxin inhibiting those enzymes from working and you can't think or you can't remember or your liver can't detoxify or you can't sleep or you're depressed because those cells are basically like ah, I can't do it I got I have no energy it's sort of like put your put a tourniquet on your hand and then start to go like this and now we're blocking blood supply so that the so that the new oxygen can't come into these cells which is similar to these things not working, you are not going to be able to do this very long or very hard because these cells can't get what they need to live. So they're very important. So root canals, my, my rules, I've never, this is true, I have never seen a chronically ill Lyme patient get better without extracting their root canals. I've never seen a pan cancer patient get better without taking care of the root canals. It just will not happen. If they're sick enough to get that disease and they have infected root canals, the root canals are a big part of it. It's really important. I've never seen a sick chronic Lyme patient with naturally treated or ozone redone root canal left in ever get better. Uh, I used to work with Dr. Bem. We had five or six patients. He said, I can redo the root canal. I can ozonate it. I can flush it out. I can clean up that tooth. That one of them got better. I finally said, don't waste your time. It was a couple thousand bucks for him to do it. Don't waste your time. They have experimentally, they have taken root canal teeth out of people, soaked them in chlorine bleach for three days, opened up the tooth, did a swab culture. The bacteria is still growing. Okay, you can't kill them. They're just, they're unkillable. They're protected too well. I'm going to skip this one. Now the environment is full of toxic stuff. Uh, this is from the Health Ranger. How much mercury is really in a flu shot? Now I don't know if you can if I can, whoops. <laughs> Don't, you didn't see that. <laughs> All right, I'm just going to blow this up. Okay, now this is staggering to me. This is staggering that someone with intelligence could ever even put up with this. <clears throat> Two parts per billion is the maximum mercury contamination level allowed by the EPA in drinking water. Two parts per billion, okay? Typical level in tuna, 250 parts per billion, okay? So don't eat too much tuna too often, okay? 500 parts per billion, highest level detected by natural, uh, by natural news, this is from the Health Ranger, natural news, and a contaminated whitefish, okay? How much is in a flu shot? 
51,000 parts per billion, and it isn't taken orally, it's injected. Now, does that make sense? Oh, and it's fine for pregnant women, and it's fine for newborn babies. It's completely irrational. This was a 20-year-old patient. Her, her family, um, her, her mom and dad are medical missionaries, and they're over in Indonesia. Um, and uh, they had a whole bunch of children, and most of them are in Tennessee, and a couple of them had Lyme, and they came down and saw me, and the kids did really well. And their sister is with the parents in Indonesia, and she started having seizures, five to eight petty mal seizures a day. She had weight loss. She went from 120 to 89 pounds. She was throwing up, vomiting, treated for Lyme uh, in Indonesia. Didn't really have any. Didn't really help her. Uh, and they sent her over here, sort of a last ditch effort, because they really thought she was going to die because she was wasting away. She couldn't eat, and she was having all these seizures. So she shows up. And on the testing that I did, I thought that she maybe had a jaw infection, a place where a wisdom tooth had been, uh, looked to me like it was infected. And um, uh, she had had her wisdom teeth pulled before all these symptoms had started, and so I thought time-wise this kind of made sense. So we did this x-ray called a cone beam CT. And on the cone beam CT, what it does is it actually measures bone density. And this is a hole in her jawbone. And these big spikes here are low density areas where the jawbone should be. Now, when the dentist went in there, there was a big hole in her jawbone full of smelly yellow green stuff two places. He did two, there were two of them. The other, the other two, these were where wisdom teeth had been. The other two were left, they were okay, and they left them alone. Okay? Here was the other one. See how, see how open that is? That should be bone. Should be trabeculated bone. Okay? Here's the other one. Big hole. Okay? So he cleans it out, he flushes it out with ozone water, and then he takes some of her blood, he takes the clot, and he takes the, the PRP, the platelet-rich plasma, he puts it in there to stimulate bone growth, then he closes it over. Okay? The next day, she doesn't have any seizures. And the next day, she's hungry and she starts to eat. And the next day, she's not having any seizures. She's having five to eight seizures a day for a long time, years. At the end of a week, she had a seizure. So I sent her back to the dentist, because sometimes these things will fill up with fluid and they need to be drained. So he went back to the dentist, he injected her again through the hole with some ozone, cleaned it out, pulled it out. She was here about three more weeks. She gained like nine, 10 pounds. She stopped having seizures and she's fine, okay? And the Lyme thing we handled easily. It was no big deal. And a lot of times this is how it kind of goes. Okay, I'm gonna... Get this. Just give you an idea about ozone. So ozone is O3. It's oxygen of three together. It has a charge on it. It has a it has a a, a, a negatively charged. Bacteria, viruses, funguses, parasites, free radicals are all positively charged. So the ozone will form a bond with that. Okay? And when it forms a bond, it will reduce it. It will, it will eradicate it. Now, if you do a test of ozone, if you look at this side first, so 4,500 bacteria, 4,500 molecules of chlorine, takes 3,500 seconds to kill it. That's chlorine bleach. If you look at ozone, 4,500 bacteria, one molecule of ozone, total kill time, one second. There are no known bacteria that are resistant to ozone. Ozone in cells is actually healthy. In our cells, it's healthy. I try to get an ozone treatment once a, every week or two because it's a performance enhancer. We have some pro athletes that come in and they get ozone because it's actually a performance enhancer. It will make your body work better. If you got bacteria and parasites and things like that, it will kill them. 
and what's left over will enhance your cells. Oh, we do a bunch of this. There's another thing that we add. Whoops. Okay. Now there are a million silver products on the market and most of them aren't any good. They're not any good because they're impure. And I want you to look at this graph. Now all they did was take six different silver products off the shelf, put them on a drop of them on a microscope and magnify it and look at them. Okay? All these silver ones with big giant particles are ineffective and they're toxic. This is Argentin 23. It is a pure solution of silver, nano silver. We pull this up through a filter needle and it will go through a smallish IV needle because it, you could never get these through an IV needle. They clog it up. And you have particles of silver floating around in your bloodstream, which isn't good. So about three quarters of the time, the ozone with the herbs that we use handles lime. Sometimes 25% of the time, we have to add the silver to it. So that's the product that we use. Now this is really interesting. This kid was 19 years old. He came from either Texas or Arizona. Incapacitating fatigue, fibromyalgia, brain fog, lost hope of ever getting better. His mother dragged him to Florida for the 20th Lyme doctor. His really biggest concern was his anxiety. He said he had anxiety to the, ex to the extent where he couldn't even feel like he lived in his skin. They tried a lot of different kinds of drugs on him. He said it never made him feel any better. He was very despondent when he came in. He never looked at me. He never talked. He was with his mom. I didn't finish the exam the first day, so I had him come back so I could talk to him. And when he came back, he was kind of brighter. And I said, what's up? He said, oh, my mom and I went out last night, and, um, and I want to show you my new tattoo. Oh, no. So he pulls up his pant leg. And he shows me the tattoo. Now, this is a big Bowie knife. That is a, flea, uh, a, a tick. So the Bowie knife is through the tick. There's an IV bottle hanging off the end of the Bowie knife, and it's running into the tick. Now, that's his calf, and that is a huge tattoo. And I looked at his mother, and I said, you know, he's already toxic. Now we just added another 25 heavy metals to it. I said, what were you thinking? I, said, I don't know. I was trying to make him happy. And he, I, he, she says, well, while I was there, I got one too. And she opens up her blouse. She's got a big eagle across her chest. Oh, my goodness. Okay? Anyway. You don't have the eagle. <laughs> I don't have the eagle. So... So this is just this is just like an example. Well, I gotta hurry up. Anyway, a lot of labs were abnormal, and and uh, I can't play this for you now. But this is now when he came, he was Mr. Gothic. Everything dyed black, black hair, those great big earrings where they kill your earlobe. You know, he just looked, you know, just like like black. And then the day before, he was so he's starting to feel better. He's feeling better. He's feeling better. And he, he, he liked, liked the ear. Oh, you can still see his ear. But he took the whole thing out. He, 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 liked, he just like became a happy kid. And he's sitting with me on the last visit before he left. And he said, you know, I, I really feel good. He said, I never thought I'd be any good. And he said, you know, the biggest thing I'm looking forward to, he was like 16. He says, I'm going to go home and get my driver's license. You know, like he was sort of excited, like what a normal kid would be excited about. The, all the black was gone. The anxiety was gone. And he was good. All right, we have a whole bunch of them. I'm going to just go through here. Let me just see this. This is, this is just interesting if you can see it. Can you see that? Yeah. So that's a normal red cell. See if I can. Whoops. So these are normal red cells. 
Nice smooth border inside and out. See that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that edge is all infected. It's infected with lime. And there's one, see the squiggle? Yeah. That's coming out of that cell or going in. Okay, so sometimes the sailing gets rough. You know, the waters can get deep. But we're after, truth is the patient's getting better. They come in like this, they go home like that. Okay, I think we have a couple minutes for questions, and then I'll stay after for a couple minutes if there's, if you want to ask me something. Yeah. Could Lyme disease um, lead to polycythemia vera? Say that again, please. Could Lyme disease lead to polycythemia vera or thick and sticky blood? Well, thick and sticky blood, yeah, but polycythemia is way is like th thought to be more genetic, but with way too many blood cells. Sometimes extra hormones could do that. There's probably other factors. As as a cause, Lyme, I don't know, but it, I think Lyme can almost do anything. Yeah. So in Lyme, including the co-infection, potentially uh, uh, Bartonella, are these microbes involved in quorum sensing when you have, it, say, a relapse, for example? I'm sure they are. It seems to be a character, the quorum, quorum sensing, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, here, here's a, a, like a perfect example. A bunch of giraffes in Africa go toward a grove. And on the outside of the grove are the older trees, and on the inside of the grove are the younger trees. Now the giraffes go up to the grove, and they started eating leaves off the outer, older, mature uh, trees. But when that tree senses that it's going to lose too many leaves and it won't be able to have enough to photosynthesize, it turns its leaves bitter. And when it turns its leaves bitter, the whole grove goes bitter. Okay? That's quorum sensing. The group, somebody in the group gets a perception and there's a communication to the rest of the group. So then, the, and the giraffes know if one got bitter, we're not going to, we're going to go, we're going to go on. Now that way they protect themselves and they protect their little ones because otherwise they wouldn't be able to grow big ones. Now, do, do bacteria have quorum sensing? Probably they do. You know, they're living, they're alive. And I think that they can communicate. And is it a particle that goes through the air? Is it a is it a wavelength that gets communicated? Do they yell at each other? Hey, the we don't even know, but we know life does communicate, and probably they do. Yeah. Yeah. Can uh, ozone pass through the blood brain barrier? And yes. Heal the mold. Yes. And can neutralize the toxins. It does neutralize. Yes. That's good. That's why I become on my other doctor give me the antibiotic. When I take it, I feel very sick. Right. But when I go for the ozone, I don't feel that sick. Maybe the ozone neutralizes the toxin. Right. That's I think good. it does neutralize toxins. If you put ozone in a room, like a, like an air ozonator, and there's smells in the room, it will handle the smells in the room. It will bind. It will bind to those things. Some of them fall to the ground. Some of them get chemical. You kill the mold too, right? Besides bacteria, virus. If there's living mold, yes, it does kill mold. And a lot of the problem with mold, it, it, it isn't that the mold, the mold could be living in you in the form of like yeasts. Mm -hmm. but, it, but a lot of it's mold toxin. It isn't actually alive, it's just the toxic particle. So I think mo ozone does bind with the toxic particle uh, and helps. And if you've got mold in your colon or in someplace else, that, that ozone will help. Yeah. Is the best way to get ozone a hyperbaric chamber with ozonated water? Um, the best way to get ozone is probably intravenously or in a steam sauna that's got ozone. You can drink ozone water. It probably has a, some effect. How much you actually get in your blood or systemically, probably not very much. Uh, ozone can be done rectally. Uh, you can get a fair dose that way. Um, most of the patients that we see, we we take their blood out, we ozonate their blood, we put it back in, or we put them in a sauna where they get a high concentration of ozone on their skin. Uh, 
with the heat, their skin opens up and the, uh, we get good levels of ozone inside. One more. And, yeah. What are your thoughts? We have an ozone, ozonator on our air, central air filtration. Is that a good idea or a bad idea? I think as long as the levels in the house aren't too high, because ozone is very acceptable to the body except if it's breathed. So if you turn your ozonator on too high and you sort of smell it and it's irritating, it's too high. Well, I think it does kill mold, and I think some air conditioning there's have ozone units built into them, and I think that's fine. But if you smell it or your eyes are burning, it's too high. Is there any other way to kill the lime besides ozone? Well, we use a mixture, and I think it takes usually a mixture. There are some companies that make good herbals and good homeopathics, and we usually do a combination. So you gotta you gotta de sort of decontaminate them, fix up their deficiencies. And then do multiple, you know, multiple sort of attacks on the line. I find that usually this combination of ozone and herbs and homeopathic is usually very successful, and most patients tolerate it very well. So if you have really high levels of EDD, which I do, um, and I have Lyme as well. Well, if the EBV is active, you have to handle the EBV too. You have to do that before you do. We usually do it at the same time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me talk to you in the